lot to talk about, a lot, uh, a lot on the plate with the session coming up. I thought we would try and make this really informal, and I'm going to start with just a couple of questions that I think are probably on people's minds to kind of get things started. And you can all answer or, or take turns or however you want to do it. It's not like anything informal. If anybody wants to, you know, kind of speak up on something, please do. Um, and if there's something you don't want to respond to, I suppose you could do that as well. But I wanted to start with really a very easy question, which actually I'm just kind of kidding because I think it is one that's on a lot of people's minds, just broadly speaking, uh, and at least get some initial thoughts on this, but um, one of the things I think that's very important to, to higher education, post-secondary education, is stability in terms of the budget, knowing where things are going to be for the long term, and, and trying to get some more certainty in things, which we really haven't had uh, too much of over the last several years. Uh, there was a lot of thought that during this legislative session, that would be the time that we kind of teed up some of the long-term solutions. With the session just upon us now, we've kind of heard about some, some new ideas that are being floated out there from uh, the governor's office from the administration dealing with uh, uh, um, gross receipts tax type of thing. So I just want to start kind of on that front. Like I said, this is a pretty easy question, but kind of what are y'all's thoughts on at least where it sounds like we are right now with the permanent solution in general, but also with this particular vehicle that seems to be at least uh, of the moment, uh, the direction that uh, the administration is, is looking at going. So I'll start with the speaker. Uh, I know this is still kind of a new idea for a lot of folks, but if you could kind of share whatever you think uh, on that. Sure, thank you. Oops. Harold may have okay. um, Good morning, and thanks again for having us. Uh, I was here last year, and um, it was a little bit of a blur a couple of weeks after I was elected speaker. So, uh, uh, in some ways, I feel like I never left. Uh, great to know. <laughs> um, what, a, what an eventful year that has been. Um, but thank you for having us. Thanks for the Board of Regents for, uh, for including us in your agenda today. And I think it's important that we, we be able to share uh, dialogue as we go forward. Um, as far as expectations for, for this session, I think there are lots of them, um, and, and rightfully so. Um, as we continue to have legislation drafted, which I'm um, talking to my staff uh, this morning, uh, there's no shortage of bills being filed. Um, as it relates to um, reform, what I would call uh, both ends, both spending reform and um, tax policy and revenue reform going forward. So, um, there, there will be no shortage of discussion in, in those regard. Um, and specific to, um, to Barry's question regarding um, the governor's proposal, I know we are awaiting a little bit more detail. I know um, his Department of Revenue staff are in the process of visiting a couple other states to get some of those details. Um, on the surface, I think a lot of folks um, anxiously um, awaiting details, not only on this plan, but on other proposals that may be made as, as I don't think it's any surprise to any of you, we have um, a roll off of some temporary taxes that roll off next June 30th. Um, and a lot of the discussion around this session will be um, around replacing that. So whether it's through the gross receipts tax or something we, we do differently with one of the other taxes, um, that will be um, the highlight and the focus of this session. Um, at the same time, I think um, a lot of my members, and I know um, it's been a discussion for the last um, two or three years as it relates to um, budgetary reform, how we budget, uh, the way we appropriate, different ways to do it, addressing dedications, a number of things that we ordinarily do in the, in the, in the budgeting process that, you know, every uh, 10, 15, 20 years or so, um, some of those things need to be reevaluated and readdressed. And, and I think you will see some of that um, this session as well. You know, a, a topic like dedications, for instance, is, is something uh, near and dear to higher ed, since uh, you don't necessarily have one, and lots of the other areas of finance do. So um, I think it's, it's important, particularly to systems like yours, that we continue to have those discussions and make sure that we're approaching that still um, as it was intended um, when those legislations and, and um, constitutional amendments were passed um, prior. So um, I think all of that is fair game. I think it's 
important that we go through that, um, and, and we'll be able to answer uh, some questions more specifically, particularly on gross receipts as we get a little more detail from both the Department of Revenue and the administration going forward. Thanks. Senator Hewitt, does your microphone work? Let's see. Don't know. Can y'all hear me? No? Can you hear that? No? no. May have to share. <laughs> <laughs> we don't mind sharing. <laughs> well, thank you for inviting me. I'm a little bit of a pinch hitter this morning for uh, Senator LaFleur, who was unable to make it at the last minute. But uh, I had planned on being here with you all anyhow. I enjoyed hearing Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Rollo talk about education from the national and the state level. And I very much want to be a part of that conversation and involved with you all in moving forward. You know, in my way of thinking, there's never been a better time to be a leader in higher education because we have tremendous opportunities. And if you got nothing else out of Act 619, there's a lot of detail in there, but if you got nothing else, I hope you got the message that you know, every idea is welcome and it's time for us to do things differently. The status quo just doesn't cut it. And we are ready for new ideas and to move things forward in a creative, innovative, fast-paced way. Don't think like educators. You guys are very smart. Everyone in here probably practically has a PhD. You're very smart. We have to think about doing things differently. And I, I hope that higher education will lead the way in, in that effort. Uh, in terms of the budget, there are some things that, that I'm working on going forward into, into this next session. I, um, as the speaker talked about, I'm very much interested on the budget side and how we spend our money more so than on the tax side. And yes, I am looking at statutory dedications. I think that is the single biggest thing that came out of Act 619 is the issue of funding and wanting a level playing field, and you all are uh, kind of having to fight with two hands tied behind your back because you don't get the, uh, the opportunity for the funding that maybe some of those groups do that have dedicated funding. And so in my way of looking at it, we can't guarantee you a minimum floor for funding. I know you'd like to have that. I don't see how we can do that. But what we can do, I think, is to undedicate many of those funds that that have enjoyed dedicated funding so that we can put all the money on the table and prioritize things in a, in a better way. And so I think that that is um, probably one of the best ways that I can help higher education in this upcoming session. And I also learned in this last year that, um, in my opinion, we don't do a very good job in the legislature of understanding what we get for every dollar that we invest in any program, whether it's higher ed or any of the other services that we provide, we don't really know what return on investment we get or where we get the most bang for our buck. In some cases, we don't know that programs maybe have been tried someplace else and failed and we're going to go down the same path. And so, you know, I'm, I'm working with the Pew Foundation and other groups doing some benchmarking with other states so that we can look at more uh, evidence-based budgeting, outcomes-based, results-based budgeting. And I think that that will give, we heard the speaker talk a lot this morning, Dr. Mitchell, about you know, the value proposition for higher ed and how much it really helps the families and the economy and it's a great way to invest a dollar. Well, I think if we have all of the other services that we support through state government kind of having to play by those same rules and looking at what's your cost benefit ratio, et cetera, I think you all will stack up very well and it will make it much easier for legislators to be able to say, in times when we need to cut funds, where should we cut? And in times when we want to invest more money in a different, pro in a different program, where do we want to invest? And I think when you have those numbers available to you that we will make much, much better decisions in a world where we are never gonna have unlimited funding. I mean, we're never gonna have unlimited funding again. It's always gonna be you know, limited and we're gonna have to make choices. And so I think that um, my interest in going forward is to help provide a, um, a process and a system by which we can gather that data and make better decisions. So I look forward to working with you on that. Thanks, yeah, trying to. 
Try that one again. We, we're going to use that one, I think. Thank, thank you, Barry. And, uh, it's an honor to be here with, uh, with the speaker and, and also with Senator Hewitt and, and with all of you. And I want to thank you all for your service. I know that you don't get paid a whole lot of money to do this, um, but, but you uh, step up anyway and, and try to make Louisiana a better place to be. And, and I want you to know that we as a legislature really appreciate your sacrifice uh, to do that. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, the state of Louisiana is not unlike the rest of the country as it come, when it comes to higher education, but there are certain things that we are outstanding at, and that has been flipping the ratio of state funding to uh, tuition over the last nine years. Um, I don't think anybody comes close uh, to where we are. And I would, I would add that while things like mandated costs continue to be a problem for, for colleges and universities across the nation, it's become, to me, an emergent situation here in the state of Louisiana where some university, there's at least one university that, that gets, that actually pays back to the state more dollars uh, than they receive in appropriations from the state of Louisiana for things like uh, benefits, retirement costs, office of risk management and otherwise. Uh, Nickel State has that distinction. I believe they got appropriated $15.3 million last year and paid back 15.4. Uh, so they actually, the students at Nickel State actually paid more back to the state than the, the state gave to the university. That's just outrageous. We've got to figure out a way to address uh, that issue moving forward. It's, it's totally unsustainable and it contributes to the problem that I think we have in the state. The number one barrier to us moving forward with the kind of, the, with the kind of growth that I think we all want to see, which is the challenge of having an educated workforce uh, that is prepared to meet the needs of businesses in the 21st century. Uh, that's what's keeping businesses away from Louisiana. Uh, that's what we need to focus on changing. You know, I think Senator Hewitt hit the nail on the head when she talked about return on investment. And we certainly need to develop a tool that can gather uh, broad-based support in the legislature that will, that will actually provide the data necessary to make those decisions. But one of, the, one of the data points that stuck out to me the most when I first got to the legislature was that we, this was, I guess, in 2008, we had finally reached funding at the Southern Regional Average for higher education. And when we looked back at the data, we, what we were able to determine was had we done it 20 years earlier, our state would have been $40 billion wealthier. The people of our state would have been $40 billion wealthier. So I can only imagine the damage that's been done over the course of the, of the last decade. And it, it, it truly makes it that much more difficult for us to compete. So, I, you know, I'm thrilled to be with you again. I feel like there are times though where everything has been said on this topic and it comes down to when are we gonna figure out a way to prioritize investing in the thing that moves the economy the most. Um, I do think we have a lot of challenges in this session and, and to me, it, it, the best way for us to set up the session and get down to business um, would would be to talk about temporary taxes that we put into place last year. And I would hope, my, my hope is that the legislature will show up and say that they want to make permanent changes and that and make a commitment not to renew these temporary taxes. Um, there's To me, there's no reason to do it. Uh, many of us didn't want to have to <coughs> increase sales tax uh, last year. Um, and I, I just, I, I would hope that we would, uh, we would immediately take the position that we're not going to allow that, that penny to continue and that we're going to instead uh, make, an, make a real effort to make structural change that moving forward puts us on a, uh, a better and more even playing field. That we prioritize programming in the way that we allow businesses to partner with our community technical colleges and with our universities to try to create the, uh, the workforce that is in demand. And, and uh, you know, I know I'm, I know I'm preaching in the choir, but I think we have, we're gonna have to continue to be more and more creative and innovative in how we deliver uh, the kind of services that, that students demand at, in this day and age. Thanks, we, we have a lot of ground or territory to try to cover, so I'm gonna throw out a few topics that I know are on a lot of people's minds. And 
if y'all can just kind of hit those, you know, a, a quick shot, because I do want to allow time for them to ask some questions as well. I think the first one um, is one that we've certainly talked about a lot, tuition. Um, you passed legislation or a constitutional amendment last year uh, to authorize tuition authority uh, to the uh, systems that did not pass. Um, yet the same issue is there. I think there's some discussion and probably will be legislation to at least have the legislature extend that authority, not through a constitutional means, uh, but maybe just through their statutory ability to do that, both either with tuition or tuition and fees. What's your thought just off the top of your head, just kind of quickly, uh, for the appetite to do that, take that approach during this session? I would encourage the next time we get a chance to talk about uh, tuition autonomy that the campaign that we put together to pass it is Currently, the legislature sets tuition. Nobody trusts them. Take that authority away from them. <laughs> you know, that was the one I wanted them to use, too. <laughs> I mean, I, I would hope that we would look at some statutory changes that would give some additional uh, autonomy to the universities to, to operate. I you obviously supported the constitutional amendment. I think I'm not sure that people fully appreciated uh, what the issue was. Uh, and, and so unfortunately, we're, we're still in the same situation we were in, but you know, I think we have to continue down that road. Otherwise, uh, otherwise you just get, you all are getting run down based on the fact that we have mandated costs that exceed the, the appropriation that the state's giving you. So you have no other choice but to look at flexibility there. Anybody else? Well, I'm not sure that I could say this eloquently as uh, Representative <laughs> Um, but I do think if you're going to hold people accountable, you have to give them all the tools to do their job. And so from that perspective, you know, I, I do believe that you should have the tuition setting authority. And I think we really didn't do a good job of marketing that uh, to our constituents so that they really understood what was being proposed. And I'll, I'll just add in, in total agreement with, with offering you that tool. I mean, I think a, a little bit of the hesitation over the last couple of years with the legislature was what that effect would do to tops, and I think we corrected that as well. So sure. I, I think I think all of all of the concerns have lined up, and I think mm -hmm. there's uh, certainly a possibility that we can be successful with that going forward and allowing that authority to take place. Well, you mentioned TOPS. I know that's another one on a lot of folks' mind. As we know, it's not fully funded this past year. It's not fully funded in the governor's budget. Um, what do you think the the atmosphere is, the environment is for, you know, maybe? Funding it more fully, or, or, or do you think where we're at is kind of where we're going to stay for a while? <laughs> I know that's not a good. It certainly is, and of course, uh, you know, talking to you folks, you know it. Um, it is certainly when we get back home, the question from a constituent that they understand the, the, the most, and that is um, what are the opportunities to add additional funding or fully funding top. So it is. Um, the top of every legislator's mind, particularly when they when they go home. So, um, I, I, I certainly um, consider that to be um, any um, any opportunity after we uh, scrub the budget um, that there are dollars available in any pot or new revenue that's generated in any effort. Uh, I know a, a lot of folks in the legislature will be certainly interested in adding that funding wherever we can, however we can at the tops. It is. Um, one of those programs, and, and, and I know um, talking to, to several of you, um, that you continue to evaluate as well. Um, you know, we've heard different pieces of legislation to limit it, to raise the standards, um, to protect our highest achieving students from going to Alabama. Um, we, we've heard all of those, uh, those, those pieces of legislation. Um, again, um, to, to Senator Hewitt's point earlier, um, the data helps us support those decisions going forward. So um, when, in fact, we, we feel like we're maybe losing students out of state, um, any data that you can certainly supply that, that, that leads us in that direction certainly makes the case stronger, and we want to make those adjustments wherever we can. Um, students go where jobs are, and, and I know that's um, utmost in, in your efforts as you go forward, um, but whether they graduate in Louisiana or graduate in Alabama, um, they're going to go where the job is. So um, as we continue to work through TOPS and a lot of the issues with higher ed, um, what we do with our workforce and the jobs we create become, become top of mind. Um, our programs like TOPS um, don't give us the value that we were hoping for. So um, I am certain that we will continue to work toward better funding in that regard. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. 
Yeah, I agree. TOPS is probably one of the only uh, programs that we support through state government that affects the general middle class. And it is probably the thing that I get the most email on and the most phone calls is about fully funding TOPS. And if we don't fully fund it, you know, how are all the different ways where you could prioritize the funding? And so, you know, I, I am working on a bill that would be sort of a backup plan on on how TOPS would be funded, if it wasn't fully funded, how you would prioritize the funding. Um, but I hope to never follow that bill because it would be my preference, of course, to fully fund TOPS as well. And um, I think that we can do that. I think that there are opportunities. I, I look at the healthcare budget in particular, just a single one out, it's $14 billion out of a $30 billion budget. So just mathematically, if there were opportunities for savings, I really do believe it's going to reside in the health care budget. And I think that is an area where we really need to focus in terms of scrubbing the budget, as the speaker said. I think that's where our, our biggest opportunities are to find some savings. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think the governor's priority and the priority of the legislature is to fully fund the TOPS program. That being said, um, if, if the legislature is unable, unable to do so this year, I think that you can consider this uh, a program that needs to be adjusted and needs to be adjusted seriously uh, in order to make it sustainable. You know, and the way that it basically works in my district is if, if someone can afford to pay for their child to go to high school, then that kid's probably gonna qualify for TOPS. But if you can't afford to send your kid to a private high school, then you're not gonna qualify for TOPS and you have to find some kind of way to pay for college, which to me is completely uh, inverse to what we should be trying to accomplish by providing students with opportunities. The reductions to the TOPS program in the last, in the last session uh, disproportionately impact low income and first time college and university attendees. And so we only have about 33% of people in this state that have a college degree. Um, if we're going to be able to uh, encourage and uh, you know encourage people to work their way out of poverty, uh, encourage people to attend college and, and get a degree, uh, we're going to have to be smarter about how we incentivize that as we move forward. And so I think that there will probably be a number of bills that get brought forward to try to stop the bleeding, um, which is is becoming uh, more and more difficult. But you may have, you may have read in the paper this morning about an idea that. I think uh, is a good one uh, that Senator Fannin is proposing, and I have a similar bill drafted, but I'm likely to just you know follow his, which would budget 98 percent of the of the dollars available in a given year, uh, so that you would have a cushion of two percent in the event of mid-year deficits. We've had 15 mid-year deficits in the last nine years. Makes sense. This year would mean 200 million dollars less to appropriate. Um, kind of makes it difficult to find tops if you put $200 million in reserve. Um, and I don't think he's suggesting that we do it immediately, but just to, just to kind of look at, at the fact that it's a program that costs about $300 million a year now um, and was growing pretty rapidly, I think, we have some, I think we have some real challenges. And I think if we, don't, if we don't figure out a way to make things stable and fund it fully this year, then I think we really need to focus in on how do you make it the most effective tool that it can. Because at some point you begin to question, what is it really worth if all you're getting is a scholarship to a college that's so terribly underfunded uh, that, that, you, that you're not getting what the, the kind of education that, that you need anyway. Uh, and, and I think we're beginning to have that struggle. Um, I think there are, there are many out there that would say, just take $300 million and give it to the universities. Um, as opposed to funneling it through these uh, through these uh, top awards, so I mean I, I think that the debate is going to get more intense uh, as session goes goes on. But I do think that the overarching focus will be to try to fund it uh, completely. I have one more question, really quickly, for you, and then I want to open it up so that that folks here can can ask you some questions. But. One of the things we've heard quite a bit over the last several years from the legislature is that higher ed needs to change, it needs to restructure itself, it needs to do things differently. Um, obviously, it's been a number of years now with the, the budget cuts and the tuition changes, all of these things. And so I guess the question is, from a legislative perspective, from the, the perspective that you have either individually or, or what you hear from colleagues in the legislature, what is the perception about 
how higher ed has changed, whether higher ed has changed, whether it's more efficient, whether it's made some of the structural changes that people seem to be talking about, at least the ones that it can, and certainly there are many that they cannot make, but what is the legislature's perception about higher ed's, uh, you know, whether it's changed or it's become more efficient? That's a... Well, it's certainly changed. I mean, we're losing professors every other day, right? I mean, our higher education system has changed dramatically. Um, and, and, not, and, and I'm not speaking, you know, I guess I'm not speaking to the fact that you've been asked to make changes and how you operate them. Uh, I think it's more that you've been forced to make changes through a lack of funding. Um, I don't think that's a good way to ever uh, address challenges that you have. Um, I think it just compiles the problem. And so as we cut uh, and cut, 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 um, and ask universities to do more with less. Um, I, I still have colleagues who want to look back 10, 12, 13 years and say, well, they're still being funded at the same level that they were funded 13 years ago, so what's the big deal? Um, I, you know, I have real concerns about the way that the Appropriations Committee looks at, at higher education and the way that they feel about uh, funding it moving forward. So, um, you know, I, I hear colleagues every day saying that they don't feel like there's anything different about higher education. I don't necessarily agree with that, but I hear my colleagues speaking in those terms. And so it, it is very concerning to me um, about where we are and uh, where we're gonna be in this legislative session. Um, again, I think it revolves around things like mandated costs that, that you have no control over. Um, and the fact that the legislature continues to, to appropriate funds that are insufficient to compete with states uh, in, in our region and, and states across the country. So um, I would just say I think we have a, uh, continue to have a major challenge with the Appropriations Committee on the House side. Yeah, Senator Hewitt, actually Act 619 sort of addressed kind of what we're talking about here. Yeah, I think uh, you know, I'm a little bit uh, more optimistic and encouraged by some of the, the work that we did in Act 619. Uh, of course, those are just words on a piece of paper. It, we're all going to be judged by our actions at the end of the day. So, you know, I encourage you to take those things, find the, the low-hanging fruit and the things that we think we can do quickly, and let's get some successes and actually put some of those things into action. And I'm going to give a shout out to my friend here, Dr. Sullivan, and he did this long before 619 was ever in print, but that is looking at realignment of some of the community and technical colleges. They announced some more realignments recently. We did a realignment between Delgado and North Shore Technical Community College. Those are tremendous things. Those are looking at efficiencies where you have schools that are close together in proximity. And I think that we can take that same model and look at, again, schools that are in different systems, that are geographically in the same regional labor market, and look at ways where you can share services or do things more efficient. You know, anytime you have a system, you have a silo, you have a barrier, and it's that way in any business, in any company, there are, there's an organizational structure, and we have one in higher ed, but to the extent that you can work beyond those boundaries, and find efficiencies and ways to work together, not only are you going to deliver a better product probably to the students and to your faculty, but you're also going to do it in a more cost-effective way. And I think that's very encouraging. I love the idea of dual enrollment. That is going to help families instantly. Dual enrollment allows students to get college credit while they're in high school that will give them a head start in college and it gives some, some students perhaps that didn't consider going to college or that were kind of on the fence about going to college, some college experience that might actually encourage them to move forward. And I think that's great. We saw the statistics from Dr. Rollo that the two-year schools and the certificates, there's a tremendous need in terms of the workforce forecast relative to the number of kids we have in the pipeline. And there's a tremendous number of jobs available to those people with a two-year degree or a certificate in, our, in the state of Louisiana. You know, so I'm all about helping students find ways to be successful. It doesn't mean that they, it's one size fits all, that everybody has to go to a four-year school. I think there's different paths and there's different ways to get there. 
and opportunities for adult learners. Dr. Rolla talked about that as well. I think we have tremendous opportunities in the state and we can, and higher ed is, is, is moving in that direction. You all were doing this before 619. It's not like it was the end all, you know, the big, you know, aha moment necessarily. But I hope that it, it encourages you and kind of lights a fire to say, let's move forward and move faster because because we have such tremendous needs and I believe we have great opportunities. You all are doing that. I think there is there is great evidence that you're changing. We just need to do it faster and we need to be able to document and show the successes um, and outcomes in terms of students getting educated, getting jobs, saving money. Those are all outcomes, those are all results that we need to be able to measure and it'll help us, again, as legislators, better to be able to support the work that you're doing with funding. Mr. Speaker. And my compliments to, uh, to Senator Hewitt with, with, with her Act 619, and of course to, to you as the Board of Regents and, and the support uh, systems that make it up. I mean, those, those were, again, additional recommendations, as she said, to a lot of the things that you were already doing. Um, I will tell you this, when you look at back at higher ed, um, jump 15 years back, um, we were at the very beginning of implementing community colleges in Louisiana. You say that, I'm, I'm sitting at a speaker's conference this past fall, um, and I talk about that, and you know, states are looking at me like, you just added community colleges 15 years ago? Um, so I, I think when, when we look at our higher ed product and, and what we have I think back to when I left um, New Iberia to come to college, I came to LSU and I thought, you know, my, my family was gonna, thinking I was moving to Massachusetts to go to college, to come to Baton Rouge. Um, I think there were 11 of us that left New Iberia to come to LSU. Now I think there's probably um, 200 that leave New Iberia every year to come to LSU at various campuses around the, uh, the state. Um, our, our product has changed. What I, what I think we need to be cognizant of going forward, and I know I'm preaching to you and you understand it clearly, um, is, the, is the way you deliver that product has had to change over time as well. Um, you know, what, what, what is appearing at our community college campuses is great news to me because I think a lot of those students were students that we lost out of the higher ed formula completely back 16, 18 years ago. Um, what, what, that, what those campuses have done across the state is no surprise, they've grown tremendously. Um, has that changed our, our, our efforts in funding? Um, not a whole lot. We're probably taking that same pot of money and spreading it around to new community college campuses as well as the traditionals that we had before those inceptions. So the challenge is there, I think, to, to Senator Hewitt's point, I think the efficiencies become more and more important. But most importantly, as I mentioned in the TOPS discussion, um, the outcomes and the data that you can provide only prove our point even more. That, that successful campuses, community college campuses, the successful campuses around the state are easy stories to tell when it comes time to make decisions about funding, revenue choices, cutting programs, those kinds of things. I think you, you know the challenge in front of you because the, the dollars have begun to slowly disappear over the last few years and you've had to make some of those hard choices. Um, we continue to support you in those choices and any efficiencies we can gain in doing that will, will certainly get us moving in the right direction. Uh, but but I, think, I think we have changed our product and I think we need to make sure our formula matches the new product. Thanks. We only got a little time left, but I know y'all must have some questions out there, so we'll try and hit those. Ralph? Uh, Senator Hewitt, to all the panelists, thank y'all for being here. But uh, in thinking different, the legislature seems to uh, support the charter movement in K-12 in general, or majority, and that's continued to grow in our state with New Orleans, I think, soon to be 100%. But uh, anyway, this, of course, is more market and choice base uh, with the idea of autonomy, sink or swim. Uh, is that something you'd consider some type of charter option for higher ed? where the idea of providing a set allocation and autonomy with tuition, risk management, procurement, et cetera, et cetera, to control the destiny uh, with customer focus. I would support that. I think we've got to do whatever we can to get our universities and, and our colleges the resources that they need and the ability to function the way that they need to function. In my view, and I, I mean, I, I, 
I can hear myself and I feel like it, uh, that I'm being negative this morning and I don't want to be because I think this is a bright light in our state and it's certainly the only way that will ever become the state that we want to be. But the legislature is holding our colleges and universities back and we need to get out of the way. That, I mean, and if that means cutting the strings in some way further, I think that that will be a benefit to students and to people in the state of Louisiana. We've proven over the last nine years that it is not a priority in spending. Um, there are, have been a multitude of opportunities to change that, and it hasn't changed. You, the stories that you tell to the Appropriations Committee are good stories. There are success stories. We have success happening at every university and every community and technical college, but it doesn't seem to be doing the trick when it comes time to fund. So I, I don't know if that's being done elsewhere, but I don't know why we wouldn't explore cre creating more autonomy um, <coughs> around a lot of different uh, areas as it relates to the operation of these universities. Anybody else real quickly? I just want to, I'm not going to answer that question. I think it's a very interesting question though. Really, I've never thought about it, but, um, but, I, but I think that's worthy of consideration. I did want to very quickly give a shout out to Dr. Henderson and the work that you all have done when we're talking about success stories. Uh, you all have done a lot of um, kind of consol not consolidation, I don't even know what the right word is, but you found a lot of efficiencies throughout your system in centralizing some services and things like that. And I know you've got some quantifiable results in that area, and I appreciate that, and I think that's another great role model. So thank you for that, sir. Mr. Speaker, you get the last word. Well, as, 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 as related to <laughs> yes. um, charter, charter equal choice in our, in our public education system, um, not that we don't have an ample choice of higher ed institutions today, but I think in the choice of how you fund your child's education going forward, that's got merit. Uh, I would be interested in learning more. Well, thank you. I'm sorry we're out of time. I know you have more questions, but um, maybe they can hang around for a few more minutes. But please give us a round of applause or give a round of applause to our legislative panel. And thank you very much.